You know, our uh, nation has been rocked in the last year and a half with COVID, all the racial issues, the debacle in Afghanistan, mental health issues of loneliness and anger and bitterness. Nothing rocks you like a death of a friend or a family member or someone that you're really close to. It happened with a family member of ours last week as I did a funeral of a man who had passed away from cancer. And I get a call, I get a text last night at 10 o'clock from a lady that my wife and and I know very well that we're good friends with, that we know her through the volleyball officiating world And she asked me to pray for her family because her brother, who had passed out at home, they took him to the hospital and they could not revive him and he passed away. And then it hit real close to home with complications with COVID and caused the passing of our own Josh Simmons. He had been the electrical, the electric guitar player in our band for 13 years. He was here every Sunday. He was present at Atoma weekends and Vista camps. A lot of you didn't know Josh Simmons, but let me just tell you that he was a different character to say the least. Some of you don't know, but in that green room behind us when we gather to pray, The last thing that we do before we come out here is that we all put our hands up together. And on three, we say strength and honor. Now, it's a very deep theological thought. And the reason it is, is that Simmons came up with it, and it was not pulled from Scripture. It was pulled from the movie Gladiator. And the moment that you would say that I don't think it has as of very spiritual significance, you were in for an argument that you were not going to win. He was different and he was the one who would, at the end, he he would always tell you his opinion whether you asked for it or not. When I was on sabbatical several years ago and Cher and I were going through the darkest time of our life, I run into Simmons at Kroger in Providence. And we meet, and he just stops, and he goes, how are you? And we begin to talk. And he was very concerned about how Shara and I were. And he said, by the way, Rick White, who has preached for you, has been unbelievable. And I said, oh, I know. I've listened. And then we're at the checkout line. He's in front of me, and we're talking. And he said, Lance Brown. Man, I love that guy. I said, you love him because you're a smart aleck just like him. That's why you love him. He said, man, he's really good. I said, I know he's really good. And so as we're checking out, Simmons was not a loud guy, but he gets almost to the door where he is exiting to go outside. And I'm still checking out. And he turns back in a loud voice. He said, oh, by the way, you might want to hurry up and get back to your job because you're not going to have one very long. Thank you for the great encouragement, Simmons. He laughed and smiled. The story goes with he and Seth Goodwin, the the guy that was one of his dearest friends. And Seth has been been our drummer. He lives in Ohio now. But they were on a mission trip together with another church way back in the day. And so there were not enough places to sleep, not enough beds. And so... Somebody brings Seth a mattress and says, here, do you want the mattress? And Seth said, well, no, I'm not going to take the mattress because if I take the mattress, then Simmons won't have a mattress. And Simmons didn't even blink. He says, I'll take the mattress. And he slept on the mattress a whole week, never offered it to Seth. He was very gracious. He was very kind. He had a great sense of humor. He could remember dates like nobody's business. And even with his witty self and how kind he was to people, man, he loved his wife of Amanda 
of five years. And at the end of the day, we all grieve because of the loss. And maybe you didn't know Josh, but maybe today you've got your own grief. Today, I was supposed to start a new series on the character of Joshua. I'm sure Simmons is heaven thinking that the only reason I did that was because of him, but it wasn't. But because of where we are, I just felt really um, led by the Spirit to go a different direction. So today, I pray you will take notes because I want to give you uh, four truths as we walk through grief. And as we begin, we are going to, I want you to know that Scripture affirms that we grieve. In just a second, we're going to stand together, and we're going to do it a little differently. You know, as we stand, we're going to read several Scripture verses that just talk about grief and that it affirms that we grieve. And so there's going to be several Scriptures that we're going to read, so I'm going to ask if you would stand with me as we read from God's Word together. And we're going to read from several places, but we're going to do it a little bit different today. As we read, I want us to all read out loud together. So can we do that? Is that good? So let's do all that together. There's going to be several verses that we're going to go through. Psalms and Roman and Revelation and the book of Ecclesiastes. So in Psalm chapter 31, verse 9, here we go. Let's read together. Here we go. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. As we pray together today, I want you to know that the Bible specifically teaches about grieving and it's something we do, and it's something that we should do. So let's pray together. Father, I pray today that in some way that you would bring healing to our lives and you would bring encouragement to where we are right now. And God, I want to thank you for the life of Josh Simmons. But God, today as we walk, as we see principles about walking through grief, as we see about truths about walking through grief. I pray, God, that we would take them to heart and we would practice them. In Jesus' name that we pray and everybody says, God bless you. You can be seated. So we got four truths as we walk through grief. Here we go. Here's the first truth is that it is real. We read scripture. We just read scripture that it is real. God's choicest servants all dealt with grief. All the prophets, every one of them. And then you get to King David, which is said about King David, the only guy in scripture that is said about that he saw with God after his whole heart. Two thirds of the Psalms. Now, the Psalms is written by David and a few other authors, but most of them by King David himself. Two thirds of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. And so, David is crying out to God. So these great servants of God, these great people of God, they were grieving. Let me tell you what they were grieving about. They usually were grieving about two things. One is, is they were, they were grieving about God's people and their sin and them turning their back on God and not honoring God with their life and honoring other gods. The second thing that they were grieving about was that they didn't understand why God wasn't coming through like they thought that God should come through. And look, this seems really a whole lot like us and, and why we grieve. Now, let me give you some examples of David crying out. Now, remember, this is the only guy in Scripture that says he sought with God. He sought God with all of his heart. 
So look at these things. Psalm 86, one through four. Hear me, hear me, Lord, and answer me. For I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. Psalm 88, verse one. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. Even from the king of the universe, Jesus himself, the one who created the world by the spoken word displays grief by the shortest verse in all of scripture, John eleven thirty five, 35. And it says, Jesus wept. So grieving is something that we do. Grief is, is that we have, is that it's real. It is said that any time that we have a major change in our life, there is grief. A loss of a job. A major change in our life. A move to another city. That you take another job. A child leaves home. A child chooses to rebel and walks away from God. A close friend gets transferred. But... There is no grief that we experience like the grief of a loved one that passes away because that is a whole new kind of grief. And we usually ask why. They were so young. They were too good. There was too much left for them to do. God was using them in such a great way. Why does this happen? We believe the power of God. And yet, we say, why this? Why now? Why them? And the reason that we grieve and the reason that all this happens and there are things that we grieve is because we live in a broken world that has been marred by sin. And because sin has caused our world to be broken, you have to understand that there are going to be bad things that will happen to all of us the rest of our life. It is real. And we need to own that. The second truth as we walk through grief is that it is lasting. Although that we know the right answers, although we know the right answers, eventually that we know that there is eternity in a place called heaven for all those who have all of us who have given our life to Christ, who know him, that we have a relationship to, with him. But we know this, this thing called grief can be lasting. Matter of fact, this grief can keep us trapped in pain for years and sometimes even a lifetime. And sometimes it doesn't go away. We just learn how to walk on through life, even through all of our grief. And it can move us to anger and bitterness and loneliness. And when there's an event that causes grief in our life, it can seem that it happened yesterday, although it might have been many, 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 many years ago. And there's no timetable of how long it's going to last. And during these times, it can seem that God is distant and really even uncaring. And it's what causes us to live in this fear and this loneliness. You see, COVID has caused great grief for so many of us. And we see the results of it now. And we struggle with this thing called, called COVID because of the months and months and months that has come on our life that has caused loneliness in some, which, some way. And then when it compiles, there is this kind of sense of hopelessness that we're not sure where to turn to. And allow me to say, Everyone experiences grief. And let me just tell you, it is why it is so important that you need a church. It's why you need a small group. I can't tell you the times that I have walked with families with grief, with passing a, with, with a loved one passing away, or they are going through grief because of a long terminal illness. 
And they come back and they say the same thing over and over and over again. And they say, I have no idea how somebody can do this without a church family. Because it has been them that have been close to me. And even though that I might have family, if they're not Christ followers, my church family understands. And they understand where there is hope. And so that's the reason that it is so important that you have a group, that you have a group that knows your name, that knows your hurts, that knows your loneliness, that knows your grief, that understands that you have pain, that can pray with you, but also that you have a group that you know other people's names and their grief and their loneliness so that you know how to pray for them. It goes both ways here. And let me say that as we are ministering to each other in this thing called grief, There's a lot of times we say, well, I really don't know what to say. Don't be worried about what to say because most of the time if you force that and you're thinking, I don't know what to say, and you try to force it because you think they want an answer, they don't want an answer. They want the presence of your life with them. They want you to walk with them, and it is the power of presence that they need. And and there's going to be times when you are walking You're going to be walking with somebody that has grief, or it might be you that's what somebody's walking with you. In both cases, let me just say, don't be pushy with it with anything. Just allow them to know that you are present, that you are there. Text them every once in a while and just say, I want you to know I'm here if you need me, but I want you to understand that I know you're struggling, I know you're hurting, but I am praying for you. Text them just your heart and pray for them through a text. Call and leave a voicemail. I don't know that anybody ever listens to their voicemail, but call in any way and pray with them through a, through a voicemail. Because I will tell you, at the end of the day, the greatest thing you have, and I don't really think that we understand this, but the greatest thing that we have in our life is the power of the written word of God, but also is the power of prayer that we pray for other people. Because when we pray, understand God moves when God's people pray. I don't think that we really understand that because there's not a sense of desperation until there is a grief in our life. And then we become desperate. I am telling you that we are headed in a country to a place that people are going to understand that the only thing that I can trust is is community called the church. We're headed that way if you don't know that. And so it's really important that you are in a group where people hear you and where, you, where people can hear your hearts. And when I say don't be pushy, but just encourage, encourage each other, encourage one another. Folks, let me just say that, man, there's people that need you and you don't even know it yet. There's some people that desperately need you in their life. So let me encourage you, get in a group. In a small group. Now, we love the fact that you're here and you're, you're here and you're watching, you're listening, you're participating, or if you're watching online, but there's nothing like being in a group where people understand you're hurt. And let me just say, when you're doing this, there's going to come a time that when you experience grief, please hear me say this. Go seek counsel from somebody that's a professional in doing counseling. And encourage people to seek counsel. Because they're going to be able to give counsel on a level that you can't give counsel. So go do that. And encourage people to do that. And I want to say as well. And I say this with, I say this with no apologies. Seek counsel from people that will give you biblical counsel. I know a guy real well that's a counselor for the state. And his greatest frustration in life is that he can't bring up spiritual things. He has to wait for them to bring it up. So our small group is always praying that people will bring those things up so that he in turn can share with them. So seek counsel from people that will give you biblical counsel. Grief, it's real, it's lasting. Here's the third truth. His promise of presence is eternal. His promise of presence is eternal. I think this is where most of us who are Christ followers, that we miss it. Now, I want you to stay with me. I want you to journey with me here. We miss it because this is what we do, is that someone gets sick, and we we claim healing. We claim verses in Scripture 
that talk about healing. We claim lyrics of song that talk about healing. And I've done this and I will continue to do this. And yet we pray for healing and it doesn't happen. And so people would say, well, it's because you didn't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, the person would have been healed. Or sometimes we get angry with God because God didn't come through like we thought God should come through. And so for some reason, we believe that if we demand that God heals, that we believe that God heals because of our faith. And yes, scripture teaches that we should have faith. The scripture says, the just shall live by faith. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we understand that we come to Christ by faith and we walk by faith. But my faith and your faith is not what we have faith in. What we have faith in, what we usually have faith in is because we have listened to some pastor or we have listened to some teacher or we have read some author that tells us about faith. And they give examples of how God has come through in the supernatural realm. And, and, and we claim those things. And yes, I do believe that God is strong enough to do what we ask him to do. But I want you to understand, folks, the reason that God comes through the way that God comes through is not because of the amount of faith that I have in my faith. It is because is that we think that we demand that God would do something that we want him to do. And I want you to understand this one. That is dangerous theology. Because all of God's promises about healing, about God's riches, they are all truth. But every scriptural promise is not based on the fact of all, of all the promises that I think God has. All the promises that God has that he's going to come through, they're promises of eternity, of eternity. They are eternal. And so what we do is that we read an author and we hear all these great stories about, well, that I prayed this and we saw God come through. Every one of you have the same kind of stories. Every one of you have prayed probably in here at some point and you've asked God to come through and you've seen God come through and God has come through and we look at that and we go, okay, now because God came through on this one, God's gonna come through like I think God ought to come through on this one. We have to understand that God comes through because of one thing and that is because of God's sovereignty. It is his all power. It is his all knowing that he comes through. It's his presence that is everywhere at once. That's the reason that God's come through. It's not because I have this supernatural kind of faith because let's be honest, all of us have more faith than others at some point in our life. And that's the reason it goes back to the community again, why we ought to have that so somebody's faith can, can spur us along. And I want you to understand today, Yes, one day we will all be rich. And yes, one day we will all rise from the dead. And yes, one day we will all be healed. But it happens in eternity. All the promises of the word of God are happens because of eternity. They will happen one day. Does God do the supernatural? And I think this is where we miss it because we forget about everyday things where God does the supernatural. The fact that you have the spirit of God that lives inside of you this morning. We sort of walk away from that thinking, well, that's not that big of a miracle. That's the greatest miracle that redemption has happened to us in some way, somehow, the supernatural act of God, the spirit of God comes to indwell in a person. That's a supernatural event. The fact that you woke up this morning and you had air to breathe and he gave you ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to obey. That's all supernatural. And we forget about those things because again, we hear stories by authors and we hear pastors and we hear teachers that talk about if you have enough faith, God will come through like you're asking God to come through. No, it's because of God's sovereignty in our life. And that's the reason that he does the supernatural. We have to keep remembering, we are not created for here. Would I rather Josh Simmons be here today and that God would have raised him out of that hospital bed? Absolutely, I would rather have that. Would I rather have that God would heal, supernaturally heal my mom of Alzheimer's? 
Yes, I would rather have that. Would I rather God heal one of your family members and one of your close friends that's struggling right now? Yes, amen, I would rather have that all day long. And we say, I thought God would heal Josh Simmons. God did heal Josh Simmons. And while we grieve of that today, he did heal him. He didn't do, he didn't do it like we prayed. And please don't say, oh, if you'd have prayed. We did pray. Oh, so many people all over America prayed for that guy. Why do we, why not happen? We continue to pray. We pray for his family. We pray for his sweet wife, Amanda. We pray for all those things. But when God doesn't do it like we thought God would, we struggle. But in reference to God's promises are eternal. Look with me. Look at Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 147, three through five. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. He is understanding has no limits. Psalm 73, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Revelation 21.4, he will wipe away every tear from their eye. That shows you that grieving is okay and that we're gonna grieve here. But there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. And then Romans 8, 28. Well, we love this one. We quote this one. And we know that in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him. For the good. For whose good? Not for your good. For his good. And for your good means eternity. That's his promises. For the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Now, I want to give you, these are not on the screen, but I want to give you three principles to remember that are not on the screen that we talk about his promise of presence is eternal. So let me say this, okay? Here's the three, here's the three principles I want to give you. Number one, we believe in God, but we don't understand the ways of God. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We don't understand the ways of God. We don't understand the sovereignty of God. One of the things that I pray every morning of my life is, God, I want to thank you for your sovereignty, but let me say, God, I don't even come close to understanding that. I don't understand why he took Josh Simmons. I, I don't get that at all. And I grieve for that. I don't understand any of that. The second principle I want to give you is, is this. We live here for certain days, but we live forever in eternity. You don't have but a certain days here. And this is what we do is that we kind of feel like, we don't say this out loud, we kind of feel like that we can tell God how many days somebody ought to live. Can I tell you about Josh Simmons right now? He is where he was created to be. And when you pass away, if you're a Christ follower, I'll speak to that in a second but you are gonna be where you were created to be. Here's the third principle. We mourn here for days, but we will rejoice forever. This statement is gonna be on the screen. I want you to see it because I really would like for you to write it down, okay? His promise of presence is eternal because the foundation is certain. His promise of presence is eternal because the foundation is certain. So, we're gonna go to Hebrews chapter one, verse three. The first part of it, okay? The sun is the radius, Jesus. 
the great high priest, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. I want us to understand this day. Why does Jesus know grief? Because of the cross, and Jesus dealt with grief. Do you remember when Jesus was on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He understood grief. He understood there was no other way. When we have grief in our life, we get to a point in some of my passes, we, we really do understand. I, I, I can't bring that person back. You see, Jesus remains firm with us. And he walks with us through our grief because of the grief he went through. So before I go to the fourth truth about walking through grief, let me say a few things. Don't deny your feelings that you are grieving. It hurts when you lose somebody and it ought to hurt because you want to see them. And if you're a Christ follower, you will see them again. But you do hurt. Secondly, it is good to grieve. It's healthy to grieve. The worst place we can be is that when we're really grieving is that when somebody asks us, we just sort of, like we got it together, we say, oh, I'm good. I'm not good. I'm not good today. I wasn't good last Sunday. And most of you are not good today either. And it's really okay to say that. And as a Christ follower, I would love for Josh Simmons to be here. I would love, <laughs> I would love because every week I would sit in the same place in the green room. No matter how many people sitting on the couch, I always went in and I sat next to Josh Simmons. And oh, how I would love to be around his smart aleck self today. I would sit in that thing and Josh kind of out of the corner of his mouth would talk to me. And when somebody would say something that he just didn't agree with, he'd say some, like some comment, he'd go, he has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> don't, don't, hey, hey, don't, don't listen to him. And he, I mean, he'd even say, they don't, I mean, they're in our band. And I mean, people that are on stage today and he is saying about them, he's saying, they, they don't even know music. Don't listen to them. And he would say, I, I really don't like our worship set today. Why, why do you not like a worship set? Uh, it's just, it's okay. It's not that great. It's okay. And so I would ask Cux, I go, why does he say that? And he goes, because it doesn't have a strong electric guitar part in it. That's why. <laughs> oh, I would love for him to be here today. As much as we hurt today, folks, you better rejoice that Josh Simmons knew Jesus. Amen. You better rejoice in that one. And let me just say, there are some of you here today and some of you watching online, let me just be really honest with you, you don't know Jesus. You don't. You've got some religion about you. You got some, you got the correct religious answers, but if you really got honest, you, you, you don't know Jesus. Can I, and let me just tell you, we, got some, we just got bad theology. People that are believers, you don't think that we're universalist? You go to a funeral, it don't matter if somebody has lived like hell all their life and have rejected Jesus and rejected the church because they like a country song about heaven, we think they're going to heaven. That's not true. A person comes to faith in Jesus when they repent of their sins and they turn their back on the world and they place their faith in Jesus and they say, I'm all in and I'm going all in for Jesus. That's when you know Jesus. I plead with you today. 
I plead with you in this moment, give your life to Jesus. With everything about me, I plead with you. I want to ask that you'd bow your head right now. We have, I got another fourth truth, but I want to stop in this moment to give you the opportunity. Oh, I plead with you, if you've never given your life to Jesus, do that right now. Say yes to him. Give your heart to him right now. Don't turn him away. Don't die in your sin. Give your heart to him. If you've never done that, give your heart to Jesus today. Right now, would you just pray this along with me? As I pray it out loud, you pray it silently. Dear God, thank you for this day. Jesus, come into my heart and save me on this day. I want heaven, but I want a relationship with you right now. And I give you my heart. Save me on this day. No one looking around, but if you just prayed that prayer right then, I'm not going to embarrass you, but if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to lift your hand right now, would you? Just right now. Amen. Just keep, keep them up. Don't, don't put them down. Just keep them up. Just keep them up. Amen. God bless you. Okay. Everybody look this way, would you? <laughs> I will assure you that Simmons is rejoicing with the angels in heaven, the people that just prayed to receive Christ. Would you join the angels in Josh Simmons right now? <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. We're fixing to go back into worship because of the fourth truth. Here's a fourth truth right here, right? His praise is honored. During our times of grief and our struggles, we say that we don't really feel like praising. And I understand that. All through the Psalms, and even through the major, the major and minor prophets, they would question God and they would grieve, but they would come back and they would praise God for who He was. And even with David, when he would cry out to God, he would always come back to the fact of worshiping, praising God. So why should I sing? Why do we sing? Here's three reasons that we sing. Number one, because it refocuses our affection toward God. During our grief, it refocuses our affection towards God. The second thing it does is that it realigns my priority. Let me tell you, the devil would love to use your grieving to move you to a place that's not a good place for you. It reminds the devil who's really in charge of this whole deal. And it also reminds us of what Jesus wants to do. But thirdly, and the best thing about it is that Jesus continually restores our soul. That doesn't mean that the grieving doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that the grieving is not there. But it's a continual thing that he restores our soul. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to, we're going to worship together. And as we do this, we're going to read some Psalms together and we're going to worship. So would you stand with me as we worship? I want you to do the same thing you did when we've, read the scriptures together in the first scripture. So we're going to read all these together, okay? So Psalm chapter 150, verses 1 one and 2, all right? So let's read together. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. <clears throat> Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Psalm 35, 18. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. Among the throngs, I will praise you. Psalm 100, verse 1. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Because your love is better than life, 
My lips will glorify you. Let's sing together. God bless you for being here today.